I'm very, very honored for this award, the Impact Voices of Courage and Conscience Media Award. There was, however, very little courage, and one would hope an ordinary amount of conscience at work in producing our Israel-Palestine episode of Parts Unknown. I was enormously grateful for the response from Palestinians in particular, for doing what seemed to me an ordinary thing, something we do all the time, show regular people doing everyday things, cooking and enjoying meals, playing with their children, talking about their lives, their hopes and dreams. It is a measure, I guess, of how twisted and shallow our depiction of a people is, that these images come as a shock to so many. The world has visited many terrible things on the Palestinian people, none more shameful than robbing them of their basic humanity. People are not statistics. That is all we attempted to show. A small, pathetically small step towards understanding. To be recognized in this way means a lot to me and to all of us who worked on the show. And for that, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thanks. Welcome to the Michael Brooks Show. I'm Michael Brooks. We're broadcasting live from Brooklyn, USA, where left is best as it is everywhere else. Greetings, comrades, friends, and enemies with super producer Matt. Wait for it. Luck. Hello, everybody. Head theoretician David Griscom. How's it going? It's going well. How did I do? Not bad at all. Sweet. Super producer David Slavic is roaming the Digitosphere, the Discord, Twitter, everywhere else, and the ever-expanding, ever-aggressive TMBS universe on this week's program, Mike Hanna. He's an independent journalist, news presenter. He covers Washington, D.C. and the United Nations for Al Jazeera. He's the former CNN Jerusalem bureau chief, and we are talking about the Trump and Un show, plus... United Nations and the crisis, the really the abuse, systemic oppression of Gaza. And where does Iran stand now, weeks after Trump detonated that deal? And then Cody Johnson, he is the host of Some More News. He joins me and we are taking on the cult of Elon Musk. Yep. I did it in cells. Sorry. Went right at your hero. Cody and I are talking about that, the why of it, and much, much more. Plus, we have a very important shout out, which will really anchor the reality of what has been behind some of these small steps of progress in the Korean Peninsula. Plus, a major global terrorist that chances are you've never heard of died today died yesterday rather he's going to be sentenced to the gulag for eternity and we have a griscom economic minute it's the hot new segment thank you dj danarchy thank you everybody let's go and let's start with an assessment of this meeting between uh, trump and uh, un the president and the chairman there's been a really bizarre media ecosystem around this meeting. There's just the innate bizarreness of uh, Trump and Kim Jong-un as leaders. There's the sort of uh, profound bizarreness of the four-minute propaganda video that Trump aides showed to press people in Singapore. And there is the reality that the results so far have been largely symbolic, but symbols really, really matter. And there is a certain derangement syndrome in opposing this meeting among some of the more sort of resistance parts of the contingent that I want to highlight along with how this looks in relation to Iran and how this fits into a broader overall Asia strategy that still remains highly militarized. But let's start by going back to, uh, and here we are, we have some B-roll of the handshakes between the president and the chairman. But let's go now back to July 3rd, 2007. This is a Democratic Party debate. And then Senator Barack Obama got this question and provided an answer that should still be the blueprint 
for all U.S. diplomacy. In 1982, Anwar Sadat traveled to Israel, a trip that resulted in a peace agreement that has lasted ever since. In the spirit of that type of bold leadership, would you be willing to meet separately, without precondition, during the first year of your administration in Washington or anywhere else with the leaders of Iran, Syria, Venezuela, Cuba, and North Korea in order to bridge the gap that divides our countries? I should also point out that Stephen is in the crowd tonight, Senator Obama. I would. Uh, and the reason is this, that the notion that somehow not talking to countries uh, is punishment to them, uh, which has been the guiding uh, diplomatic principle of this administration, is ridiculous. Now, Ronald Reagan and Democratic presidents like JFK constantly spoke to Soviet Union at a time when Ronald Reagan called them an evil, evil empire. And the reason is because they understood that we may not trust them, they may pose an extraordinary danger to this country, uh, but we have the obligation to find uh, areas where we can potentially move forward. Uh, and, uh, and I think that it is uh, a disgrace that we have not spoken to them. We've been talking about Iraq. One of the first things that I would do in terms of uh, moving a diplomatic effort in the region forward uh, is to send a signal that we need to talk to Iran and Syria because they're going to have responsibilities if Iraq collapses. Okay, so he was absolutely right. He remains absolutely right. Let's be clear about this. Yes, the results of this meeting were symbolic. There was aspirations about denuclearization. That's not happening anytime soon. There was a military exercises, war games that Trump called off, clearly without coordination with South, South Korea and without coordination with his own military. That remains to be seen. I think calling a lot of those exercises off is a good thing. So even what he has impulsively given up is a positive signal. Now, just to give a little bit of context here, there's a history that I spoke about uh, several episodes ago on the sort of history of policy failures and attempts at diplomacy with uh, North Korea. There was the agreed framework in the Clinton administration, which was bogged with problems from the beginning. There was a reckless pullout by the Bush administration. Then there was an attempt to reach a similar sort of deal in 2005. Obama practiced strategic patience with regards to North Korea and not actually the commitment uh, that he made in this uh, debate answer. And now we have clearly, again, a reckless president, one who doesn't do strategy, one who has no coherence of worldview. But with regards to this situation, the sort of liberal hysteria about leverage is a myth that we'll get to in a second. But let's get a little bit more broadly into the history here. Now, the North Korean regime is absolutely one really arguably unparalleled in terms of humanitarian abuses. Everything from ordering killings in his own family to systems of gulags, pol political monitoring, sexual violence, everything imaginable this regime does. That's not debatable. There's also the reality that over a million civilians over 3 million civilians were killed in the Korean War, with the majority of them in the North. I had seen war-battered cities in Europe, the Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas confessed, but I have not seen the devastation I had until I had seen Korea. One of the most brutal episodes was the No Gun Re Massacre, in which U.S. machine gunned, which the United States troops machine gunned hundreds of Korean civilians who had huddled under a bridge for safety. The United States absolutely was complicit in horrific crimes towards North Korea and from the North Korean perspective has maintained a, a circle of U.S. troop presence inside South Korea, uh, war games uh, surrounding it, and issued its own threats and condemnations of it as a regime. So that's not an excuse. That's just a full understanding of the reality. Now, some Democrats and some sort of mainstream commentators seem to go in reverse gear from freak out that Trump was going to start a global war with North Korea, which is a legitimate concern given the state of mind and competence of this administration, to a reverse ultra hawkery and performativity about the imagery of meeting with uh, Un with Kim and the real and the and the idea that because. The North Koreans want this level of recognition and prestige, that this is a sort of 
unbelievably important U.S. bargaining chip that Trump was giving up. And it is true. This is something that the North Koreans have always wanted. They've wanted it for decades, and they haven't gotten it. They didn't have it with Clinton. They didn't have it with Bush. They obviously didn't have it with Obama. Now, what has that posture achieved? Nothing. <laughs> that, po that posture has achieved more isolation, more uh, sort of wars of words. None of these previous diplomatic agreements, including the more ambitious agreed framework, have sustained. And North Korea has nuclear weapons. So this is a, fa this is a fear about a ship that has already sailed. Any person who is right-minded knows that the reality is that war with North Korea, unless you're a lunatic, a demented person like Lindsey Graham who's mused on this and said better they die than we die, that military conflict with North Korea is impossible right now. It is an impossibility. Anybody who would advocate for that is advocating for a mass unnecessary death period, including the destruction of one of our most important allies, even from that very basic strategic perspective, not to mention the mass humanitarian consequences. There will be no war unless people who really believe in God get into power, okay? And, or maybe there will be war because our policy in Asia is essentially a subsidiary of the arms manufacturing industry, which is a deeper structural problem over the next couple of decades, particularly as we deal with issues like the Taiwan Straits with China. But with regards to North Korea, we can't have war with them. That means that the best scenarios we can have is an open line of communication between leadership, so that as an example, a mistake doesn't happen. A uh, satellite isn't misinterpreted to be a weapon, as an example. That people can, this is actually one of the biggest concerns of Korea experts, was that a conflict could break out purely based to non-traditional, to lines of communication not being properly established, which was a major concern at the beginning of this administration. Now there is a line of communication between the two dictators. That's a positive step forward. And also, I would suggest that for all of the rightful cynicism and concern uh, and fear about anything this administration is involved in, some of the rhetoric coming out of this meeting and the reality of the meeting validates the peace movement in South Korea, which we'll be talking about in the, in the shout out. An opinion whose I would weigh sort of much more highly than the average overcompensated NBC hawk. This looks ridiculous in relation to Iran. Iran made real sacrifices. They did a real deal and they were portrayed. There's no doubt that the United States and Trump looks absolutely ludicrous in the global system. And the lesson for any state is to acquire weapons and get that deterrence. That's a bigger structural problem. But the reality of what North Korea and the United States face is that negotiation and talks are literally the only thing possible. And this, as ridiculous as it was, was a step in the direction, in a positive direction that everybody should recognize. Now, we will get actually relatively quickly to the shout out because we want to talk about a really special group. Yes, well, this is important. Danarchy. I don't want to get greedy, but if Danarchy could give us a shout out beat, that would be ill. Top of the line professionals. Let's get to uh, the shout out. Shout out, shout out. Creepy. Shout out, shout out, shout out. Weird. I think that's creepy. <laughs> it, 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 it's incredible. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is crazy. Shout out, shout out, shout out, shout out. This is out of control. Shout out, shout out. That's creepy. Shout out, shout out. That's were you feeling that as much as it looked like, Griscom? <laughs> you were really into that, man. Dude, I love that Alex Jones voice. Man. Alex Jones, dude. Alex Jones spits. It's just, it's not debatable. <laughs> it's the finest broadcast of our generation. Um, there is a group, I believe it is called Woman Crossing the DMZ. 
The DMZ is the demilitarized zone. Not the Dennis Miller thing. It's definitely not the Dennis Miller thing. And I would, I bet m- many women would prefer to cross the DMZ than cross the DMZ. Um, but it's a nonviolent uh, civil society organization based in South Korea, uh, Korea that advocates for peace and reconciliation between both sides of the conflict. And they do this in a variety of ways, including lobbying, media appearances, um, and sort of trying to shape a broader narrative about this conflict. They're certainly influential uh, to some extent uh, in the current South Korean government, which has adopted a significantly more conciliatory and diplomatic tone, and they definitely should be praised and acknowledged uh, every step of the way, Moon Jae-in uh, and the current South Korean government. I'm going to read now. This is first from Brookings on May, and but this 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 also involves civil society protests in one of the most um, tense pieces of physical space in the pla- on the planet, the demilitarized zone between South and North Korea. On May 24th, 2015, 30 women from 15 countries traversed north to south over 38th parallel that has divided the Korean peninsula for almost 70 years. Although critics that condemn these women as naive dupes of the Pyongyang regime, e.g. South Korean protesters harangue them with insults such as useful idiots, which is typical right-wing sort of stuff, and, decise, uh, and deceive the world, you are unqualified for peace. What these women did... Uh, and we'll quote, I'm going to continue quoting now from, um, from this is now from their own site, in their own words. On May 2015, on the 70th anniversary of Korea's division into two, two separate states by the Cold War powers, 30 international women peacemakers from around the world walked with thousands of Korean women north and south to call it an end to the Korean War, reunification of families, and women's leadership in the peace process. We held international peace symposiums in Pyongyang and Seoul where we listened to Korean women and shared our experiences and ideas of mobilizing women to bring an end to war and violent conflict. On May 24th, International Women's Day for Peace and Disarmaments, we successfully crossed the two-mile-wide demilitarized zone that separates millions of Korean families as a symbolic act of peace. That energy is part of the context that allows for the symbology of what we saw in Singapore and symbology is actually very important in international affairs. So all props to them, to uh, the woman, uh, woman for a uh, woman crossing the DMZ. They are the shout out. And uh, let's talk about why it's time if you haven't yet. And a lot of you have to become a patron of TMBS we continue to grow steadily so as as always we thank all of you i want to thank everybody on the team and all the patrons who are making this possible woke bros is the new show exclusively for patrons that i co-host with waz who's of course crew on this show we give you this show a lot of work goes into a two-hour public show that we do every week and the vision really to kind of have almost like a late night show of youtube that sort of covers everything from the sacred to the profane, <laughs> from the from the crass to the most evolved. We want to hit it all, and of course, including those animations. Then the post game, which um, when we announce our YouTube, new YouTube channel, which I think is going to be next week, we're going to unlock a couple of those, as well as starting to chop these up into smaller bits of content so you can keep sort of spreading the message, the content, uh, across all of your social networks dissemination dissemination it's a big i mean you see disseminating it's there's a lot of heat around it uh and uh the illicit history series continues this past sunday mark blythe uh stopped by official friend of show now uh to talk about the eurozone this sunday uh on a follow-up uh we're actually talking with a uh, eurozone policy maker on what a reworked eurozone based on a workers movement would actually look like if you go into the archives there's everything from histories of silicon valley fascism to jamaican politics to theory primers on the basic the abcs of marxism clr james the russian revolution it's a full political education plus a community on discord plus if you go comrade or above phone calls with me we have a lot of momentum 
It's real. It's focused on winning. It's socialist. It's unapologetic. It's global. The patron count from every corner of the earth is very, very satisfying and meaning, particularly to me, uh, my sort of outlook on things. So patreon.com slash TMBS, patreon.com slash TMBS. It's time to keep spreading the word. You can follow us all on Twitter um, at underscore Michael Brooks at TMBS uh, FM at Matt Luck. You got, you got Correct. that? Correct. M-A-T-T-L-E-C-H. And what do you got, David? You have at David? At David Griscom. Perfect. At David Griscom. Uh, find us. Spread the word. Join. It's time. We'll be right back with Mike Hanna. Welcome back to the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Mike Hanna. He's an independent journalist and news presenter. He covers the United Nations in Washington, D.C. for Al Jazeera, and he's the former CNN Jerusalem bureau chief and, of course, uh, the foreign policy czar of the Michael Brooks Show. Mike, thanks so much for being here. Uh, it's great to be here, Michael. I would like to start, Mike, with your thoughts on uh, this meeting that took place uh, between uh, uh, the U.S. leader, Trump, uh, North Korean leader, uh, Un. You know, I I'll just set it really briefly by saying that my basic stance on this is that it is certainly better that these two countries be in communication, uh, given, the, con given the, the context. I think that's certainly preferable to a sort of war of words and threats. The meeting may have been uh, almost entirely symbolic, but symbol symbols are, are powerful. Well, what's your take? Yes, I think that's precisely correct. It's far better, regardless of the context in which these leaders are talking to each other, rather than the kind of massive threats and on the brink of war that we had for so many months in the course of the beginning of the Trump administration. All of that being said, though, the uh, possibility or the danger is, is that everything's being set up for a fall. Uh, this meeting went ahead, symbolic, as you say it was, there are policy teams working behind this. There will be ongoing negotiations, obviously. Substantive negotiations have already taken place before this meeting happened. We know that between senior negotiators from the U.S., senior negotiators from North Korea, whom incidentally have negotiated on a number of occasions before in past years during the um, uh, Six Powers talks, for example. But the danger is that this is being set up for a fall. And there's one simple fact that underlines all of this. This is, I think, the eighth such uh, agreement or commitment signed by North Korea concerning denuclearization. They have all fallen apart for some reason or other, normally because of North Korea noncompliance. I think that we've got to temper the um, delight, is too strong a word, but the uh, approval of this meeting with the knowledge of what has happened in the past and the difficulty of the negotiations to come. Do you see a paradox in that, though, between the fact that, yes, these previous things, like the agreed framework that I was talking about earlier during the Clinton administration, yes, they fell apart, and I agree with you, uh, it does seem to be. I mean, the United States had its own problems, and certainly the Bush administration, I think, particularly upon incoming, incoming into office, was very reckless about uh, not only the agreed framework, but also undermining uh, a, a more sort of dovish South Korean government at that time. But that being said, what strikes me, and I could be wrong about this, but it's sort of the, the, the paradox is, is that on one hand, yes, these agreements have collapsed in the past. Those agreements in the past have been much more narrow and specific. This agreement or non-agreement so far, I mean, what was actually signed was both you know, nothing really in terms of specifics. Actually, I think the highest specifics that they just signed in Singapore was helping retrieve, uh, you know, POW's remains. Um, and then on the other hand, much more sort of aspirational in terms of, you know, these, you know, goals that are obviously laudable and we would all want, but much more in the future, you know, denuclearizing the peninsula. This was not something that the Clinton administration was talking with the North Koreans about. So there's something in that paradox. Well, well yes, it is, Michael. But, but let me just, there's a couple of things I must pick up there. Uh, firstly, yeah. the last thing you said, that term denuclearization. Now, that has been a term that is actually largely responsible for every single set of talks or mm -hmm. every single agreement breaking down. Yeah. Because 
different people mean different things by denuclearization. Uh, the U.S. has always kind of said, yep, you denuclearize, you, North Korea. The North Korean position has been total denuclearization. Right. When it uses that phrase, it is talking about a denuclearization of all the parties involved in the region, even the United States with regards to that region. Right. So it's a far broader perspective, and that is precisely what we have in this agreement today from yeah. the North Korean side. But there's another very important point there. There is, in all of this, been one remarkable concession given, and that is by the U.S. For years, China has been arguing substantively that there has to be a freeze-for-freeze freeze scenario. In other words, a disarmament process can begin if the U.S. steps back. So it's a quid uh, pro quo. Donald Trump has just agreed to a freeze-for-freeze freeze scenario with nothing concrete from the other side. Now, that is a massive shift in U.S. policy. Absolutely huge. It was a position that previous U.S. administrations would not budge from. The idea of freeze-for-freeze freeze indicates a kind of equality between the two parties and denies the fact that in all of this, one must remember, there is an extremely dangerous party involved from the U.S. perspective. Now, that particular point had always been used as leverage in negotiations. That has just been thrown away with nothing concrete beginning in return. For a great deal maker, Donald Trump has basically given the price away of the real estate before negotiating a, a closing pr a deal. So there is something substantive in this, and that is the most substantive thing that has come out of it. And certainly the North Korean negotiators know that, and they know that they are starting off negotiations with already three aces showing looking at a pair of twos across the table. Right. I mean, that, I, I, I see that. And I think, I mean, that's just sort of undeniably true. It, it, it's, I guess it strikes me that a more, a more, a, a different type of leader than Trump, though, to me, could have made a very similar decision just from the perspective, and this is just sort of my view, that we sort of know, and we'll get to Iran in a moment, but, and the lessons of this are, are really clear internationally and not positive, uh, you know, which is that, look, war with North Korea is unthinkable for any rational person who had any humanitarian concern for North Korea, for South Korea, for Japan, I mean, for potentially even a broader regional conflict. So once you sort of recognize that, it seems like, okay, so what, what do we have to do here, including potentially jettisoning old postures to actually kind of move a process. Now, I agree that Trump, you know, I doubt there's much sort of design behind it. But I, you know, I hesitate, I guess, from getting overly worried about, you know, this sort of like notion that you're giving away the store when it seems to me that, you know, we're already kind of past that point. They've already, by acquiring this capacity, made the other alternatives unthinkable. So we need to, you know, figure out what is this actually going to look like? And potentially maybe it does look like a bit of a less aggressive posture on the peninsula. It seems, you know, to some, I mean, certainly the South Koreans don't want us to leave like that at all. But it does seem that the current current South Korean leadership is open to at least the sort of reduced temperature. And obviously China is. So it seems to me it's just maybe potentially walking through the only door that's open. And it just does take this kind of, you know, reckless guy who thinks he's a great negotiator to do it, even though he's not actually doing that. Yes, I, I think those are all valid points, Michael. But I, I think that most observers um, with an interest in a lasting deal that isn't tossed and thrown out in some yeah. choleric whim because it's, it's not being done would have been much happier in some way, some kind of verification process was introduced into this broad declaration that we've had now. Yeah. There's no mention of rejoining the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Right. Right. There's no mention of the International uh, Atomic Energy Agency, which throughout the years, throughout the decades, has been the monitor of either disarmament or armament, in, uh, whatever the case may be. Um, so I just think that it needed that kind of... of outside force, a force that has been a solid throughout the decade uh, that basically doesn't have a dog in this particular symbolic show. The idea of verification, I think, is central and basic to this process actually working and would 
obviate some of the dangers that I mentioned earlier yeah. in terms of raising massive hopes, only setting up for a massive fall. And I do think that even at this stage, the idea of verification is absolutely essential, if only to identify what body, what agency is going to be doing the verification. So that being said, and if we were writing a comedy script now, what would flow exactly out of the point that you just made well would be the sort of call where the North Korean leader uh, phones up the Iranian leadership and is like, you guys are total <laughs> morons. Like, we just had to say that he builds cool hotels and we got everything we wanted. And you did this whole back channel through Switzerland and had this long convoluted <laughs> process. Like, what are you guys doing? Because, of course, the well, but- Trump administration <laughs> utterly jettisoned precisely the sort of successful version of the kind of deal you're talking about. Maybe first you could discuss that contrast, and then we'll get into some of the specifics of the fallout of the Iran pullout a couple of weeks in. I think there's a very basic point here, Michael, and and, and all of that is absolutely correct. I mean, the IAEA are the people who are verifying Iranian compliance, which they have continued to do since the Iranian nuclear deal was signed. But there's a difference here, and certainly there's a big difference that would appear in the eyes of President Trump himself. Iran did not have weaponized nuclear capacity. North Korea did. The lesson to be learned from this is if you have a viable threat, then you get a lot more than if you don't. So what we are not talking, what we are talking about here is a compliance with a commitment not to weaponize. We are talking about a controlled lack of weaponization. Now, that's a very different thing. And I think that the irony, of course, is is absolutely remarkable. The deal that um, President Trump has just torn up and thrown away was a deeply complex deal that had at its basis the idea of verification, that point that I mentioned before. Verification not being done by the United States, being done by the IAEA and by its watchdog bodies, by its inspectors who are on the ground who visit Iranian sites. So there is a complete, um, well, it's, it's absolutely science fiction in a way to, to look at these two cases right. and to kind of see within which one is being done and the other isn't. But once again, we get back to the point that you made right at the beginning. It's better that this is happening at this stage than that it's not, regardless of the fact that a deal that took years to actually work out and a deal that every other party to the treaty um, agrees was working to get thrown out on basically a presidential firm. How is this playing out? You're at the United Nations. I mean, certainly the Europeans have expressed their strong intentions to try to save the deal. Um, Obviously, China and Russia already had different types of relations with Iran, Uh, although there are some reports already indicating. I mean, I think as an example, I think Nike has canceled their contract to outfit the Iranian uh, national soccer team. What does this look like a couple of weeks in, in terms of the sort of, and, and, and as well as Iran sort of playing a delicate diplomacy of actually seeking to preserve the deal uh, while also obviously reserving its own right to, to step out of it? Well, look, it's actually complex, not only in terms of the technology of setting up the deal, but actually the legal complexities of it. Um, put most simply, This is not a bilateral deal between the U.S. and Iran. Legally, in terms of international law, the U.S. cannot simply unilaterally walk away from the deal. There's legal ramifications there, which will play out in the weeks and months and possibly years ahead. The scenario is, quite simply, is that the U.S. tacked on by what was then a hostile um, Congress to the then uh, President Obama, tacked on a clause that has nothing to do with the deal that was signed between the parties involved. And that is that Congress has the right uh, to lift the waiver on sanctions should it so be instructed by the president if the president is not satisfied with the process. Now, that has nothing to do with the deal, but that is something that Trump um, brought up by refusing to sign the waiver on sanctions, throwing it back to Congress. Congress can now reinstitute new sanctions against Iran in defiance of the deal. But this is all totally separate to the international legal foundation of the deal itself, which is a deal signed by all parties and absolutely specifically within the agreement cannot be abrogated 
by one without agreement of all the others. So, look, you've got a massive legal mess here that it's quite simple for President Trump and the Trump administration to say, don't want this deal anymore. Iranians are being horrible. They are a threat to the region. OK, we're throwing the deal away. Also stating, of course, that nobody's arguing the issue of compliance and verification. Right. There is no argument about that. The justification for tearing up the deal relates to other Iranian actions as perceived by the United States not by their compliance in terms of the Nuclear Disarmament Treaty. So we're in a complete legal morass here, and it's very, very difficult to see how it can emerge without this ongoing unilateral action by the United States, which continues uh, to distance itself from longtime allies and also longtime partners in something like a nuclear deal who may not be allies, but in this particular thing, were allies in getting the deal through. So you're looking at a sense of isolationism, um, which is, lies at the bottom of all of this, which goes far beyond simply the Iranian nuclear deal. It goes to the standing of the U.S. within the world as a whole. And no doubt the Iranians are saying, too, to the North Koreans, don't sign anything with that administration because, really, its word just isn't worth anything anymore. Right. Let's okay. Let's shift. I do want to touch on Gaza a bit uh, uh, before we go. First, you, we've talked about this before. You were the CNN uh, Jerusalem bureau chief. You also did very powerful, uh, important coverage of Cast Lead uh, in 2008, I believe, or 2009. Uh, We've talked about it. We did the illicit history for this program on Ehud Olmert, where we talked extensively about that operation. When you look at what's happened in Gaza over the past several uh, months, and you know, obviously, particularly the killings on the day of the Jerusalem embassy opening, first of all, I guess, I mean, how much does it echo what you already saw and experienced in Gaza? And Attached to that, does it strike you that we're really at a point now where there isn't even a sort of basic Israeli interest in kind of a global public perception? That it's just sort of that this is who we are and what we'll do, and that is just so, and we have U.S. backing, and that's it. Well, I think what you've got to do is see Gaza always, but specifically and particularly in the last year, as more a reflection of Palestinian resistance than a regional resistance to Israel. Mm -hmm. You are looking at a scenario where a Palestinian authority has been crippled both by its own inadequacy and by the controls exerted by Israel. The only sign of real Palestinian resistance that remains is in Gaza. And there's a great awareness of that within Gaza. Hamas has perhaps strategically and perhaps very cleverly seen this, pinpointed the need for some kind of Palestinian resistance to manifest itself to prevent complete capitulation, right. the kind of cap capitulation that many would argue has been demonstrated in the West Bank, has been demonstrated by the Palestinian Authority. So the solution to the Gaza crisis is, is a wider one. It has to do with Palestinian nationalism. It has to do with Palestinian recognition. The, without that, it's very, very fertile land for those, some of those within Hamas, who may not be interested in any settlement, who may indeed be um, set on a course of, of violence. But it's a violence that is generated by the occupation. So you get back to a scenario where any solution to what is happening in Gaza, humanitarian, political, is a solution that starts with recognizing and dealing with the occupation. It's both that simple and that complex. The Israeli administration, as it stands at present, is not interested in discussing the occupation. The Trump administration is certainly not interested in discussing the occupation. So there you have a scenario where you've got the United States current administration with the agreement and indeed Israel to create a new scenario out of it, and that is Iran. That what is happening in Gaza is a minor sideshow 
to the greater perceived manipulations of the Iranian power. Right. So you are moving away from dealing with the problem, which is the occupation, to intensifying the problem, um, which is using a cause which, yes, it may be uh, valid in terms of Iranian support for what is happening in Gaza, but it doesn't deal with the problem. It doesn't approach to begin to find any form of solution whatsoever. Is there any difference now in terms of, I mean, maybe just before we go, could you speak briefly specifically on the Kuwaiti resolution that was before the Security Council that was obviously vetoed by Nikki Haley? It seemed to me, and obviously you know this much better, but it seemed to me that that resolution went a big a bit further than ones in the past, and the sort of general acceptance or at least acquiescence of it outside of the United States was particularly striking. It was indeed uh, what is happening in Gaza, particularly at the time that that emergency security council was called and that Kuwaiti resolution introduced, had certainly inflamed uh, passions, had made even those who normally sit on the fence jump down solidly behind the terms of the resolution. Um, so, yes, circumstances have created an international awareness of uh, a situation that is happening there that is largely attributable to the actions of the Israeli army and the policies of the Israeli government. Now, that was borne out by the fact that in that Security Council vote, uh, the only one against was the United States veto, which meant it didn't go through. So incidentally, that is why the General Assembly session is being held um, this week to pass a similar resolution by the Kuwaitis which has no legal standing, of course, it is largely symbolic, but it will be very interesting there to see the votes uh, that are, are, are counted in favor of the resolution, which are likely to be overwhelmingly in favor. Uh, but just to mention one more thing about that Security Council meeting, Michael, the U.S., as you know, introduced its own resolution, uh, which basically put all the blame on Hamas uh, for all the violence, uh, didn't see... Israel as a perpetrator in any way, seeing it as defending its national sovereignty. Now, in an unprecedented move, the only person who voted for that resolution was the uh, ambassador that entered it. So yeah. never before in the United Nations Security Council has there been such a humiliation of a sitting member introducing a resolution, which is what happened on that occasion, which shows you the depth of anger, the depth of international opposition, to what is happening in Gaza. Mike Hanna, he's a presenter, news presenter, journalist. He covers the United Nations, as well as Washington Global Affairs for Al Jazeera. Mike, I always appreciate your time immensely. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michael. Lovely to be on the show again. Okay, talk with you soon. Thank you. All right, folks. Um, it is time for the, bless you, Matt. It's okay. This is very much a captive environment in here. Um, I've been really taking a much better care of my health. Okay, it's time for the Grizz Come. Yes? Correct? Grizz Come. Come. Sorry. Okay, play it again. It's time for a Grizz Come. Grizz Come Economic Minute with our esteemed theoretician, David Grizz Come. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I've been cursed with the deceptively. Uh, I'm sorry. Easy I actually, it's very funny. I'm I'm like neurotic about names because I do mess them up. And I and yours was like a, it was like a non-linear threat. It was like a black swan threat. I didn't even see it coming. Yeah. Well, um, turn away from me to everyone else. Um, let's talk about these unemployment numbers. Um, I'm sure at the beginning of uh, you know of this month we all noticed. Uh, our good friend Donald Trump tweeting about this is the greatest economy Great. in the history of America. Great numbers. Um, touting a 3.8 percent uh, unemployment rate, which is you know significant. I mean, this is yep. you know historically low, and there is a lot lower rates of uh, black unemployment, which Trump again cynically highlights. But there's a lot missing um, from the euphoria and the headlines about the uh, about the unemployment rate, um, specifically wage growth. So from 2017 um, to June 2018, 
there's only been a 2.7 increase for non-managerial workers, which is barely above inflation. And it is like, just for context, it's below the average incre increase in rent prices, which was 3.8% yeah. rise last year. Um, you know, so most of the gains that we've seen in the economy continue to go to a certain class, which is not the majority of the people and it's definitely not the working class. Um, some additional factors about the uh, unemployment rate that I'd just like to mention before we get into the main segment. Um, you know, one thing that was really interesting about these most recent numbers is the share of older workers, uh, workers in their 60s and above, mm -hmm. um, who, may, who are still in the labor market, which right. basically means a lot of workers don't feel confident enough to be able to retire. Right. Um, so why is it so upsetting that there's been such a stagnant uh, growth in wages? It's because the promise of unemployment, the reason we pay attention to this uh, indicator, is because a tighter labor market should mean that we have higher wages for workers, because workers should be more confident, because employers are less likely to want to lose workers that they have, because there's a smaller pool of applicants and qualified applicants. Um, but we're not seeing that at all. Um, despite that, you know, in the first quarter of 2018, corporate profits um, were historic in the past seven years at 16.3%. But corporations are not investing that money into their businesses. Right. They're investing it and they're giving it basically back to their stockholders Just and taking shareholders. it as, pro as yep. profit. So we're not seeing, you know, any real increases in benefits for working people who make the value and the benefits of uh, these corporations. Just another thing, just for context, because I have to call them out. Um, in the first quarter of uh, 2018, the baking industry made $56 billion, which is a record year of profits, despite their constant claims that they're an over-regulated market. Right. Um, so anyway, so about this unemployment factor, um, there's a couple things that the left, are, uh, good, people who have goodwill who are trying to understand this phenomenon constantly cite, and I just want to correct the record a little bit. Um, the first thing that a lot of people are talking about is automation. Right. And there's all this fear that robots are coming in and they're taking our jobs or jobs are being automated away. Well, I had heard that there was a model that uh, would not bitch about his last name. <laughs> That'd be a good yeah, one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, and I can't do a good robot voice, so uh -huh. he might have me beat there too. Yeah, yeah. But um, Alexander Coburn was my hero. <laughs> Pronounce my name however you like. <laughs> Um, Sorry. Yes. No, please go ahead. There's right. the, the idea. Yes. Robots are taking our jobs. You say not true. Well, I say not true because if that, yes. were, the, if that were the case, then we would see much larger um, product. We'd see a spike in productivity um, along with a larger unemployment rate. And we would also see a large increase in GDP growth, which is not the case. In fact, the past eight uh, years have been abysmal in productivity growth. I mean, we're hanging around like less than 1% in productivity growth. And that's because y literally like human productivity has been pushed to the point of like just along all collars of the work chain from just raw, brutal overwork of people doing physical or uh, service sector job. They're just totally overworked to literally the bone. And then even people who are much more, you know, privileged workers are actually in their own way still completely overextend. Like if you talk to people who work in, you know, tech or law, like, you know, types of hours and time commitments that just, if they were pushed more, it would literally be physically impossible for them to complete tasks. So what you're saying though, but, but the number of productivity rises would be reflected differently if robots were really swooping in because then you could, you know, extract more well, you, productivity yeah, exactly. from automated labor but, so you would see higher jumps but you know about your point you know yeah. what we are seeing is we're seeing a huge rise in people who are having to work two to three right jobs to get by right so you know wages right. are, are stagnant and you know people basically are unable to to get by on the on the wages that they have from having uh, full-time jobs so i mean but basically the biggest factor with that though michael just to uh, this is 100 percent correct us we really couldn't be squeezing the market uh, much more than we are unless we we're making investments to make you know work better for people, which obviously oh, they're not yeah, very well, interested no, in God doing. God forbid, yeah, but fuck that. It's right. the old technologies that are really getting people in trouble. It's it's uh, communication and distribution chains. What does that mean? I mean the ability of uh, U.S. companies to be able to go to de the developing world and there have most of our consumer goods be produced in other countries. So. You know, I hate to say it, but it's really the old model of capitalism that still is the model of capitalism that we need to be talking about and, and working um, to, to change and to um, make different. The supply because chain is globally distributed. The IP is here. Yes. And so the incorporations are in Ireland. 
Yes. So you pay less taxes. Well, of course, I'm corporations yeah, pay yeah. nothing more than, right. than paying any taxes. Right. So, I mean, the, basically, what I'm trying to say is like the logic of capitalism is the same way that it's been for 150 years, which is that certain corporations are able to grow monopoly power through using technologies and distribution and transportation to have a stronger hold over their working over the working class. The working class is only able to rise up when they're organized and they have solidarity between 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 workers. And we've seen across the board in the Western uh, countries, even in the UK right now, we're seeing a similar kind of situation with wages stagnating. So it's not just an American um, problem. And this is what happens when you know you lose the ability of the working class to be able to organize together to demand higher wages. So basically, I you know just to sum it up in one line, it's not robots, stupid. It's class power. I love it. Perfect. Nailed it again. That's the third Griscom Economic Minute. Um, first of, uh, or third of many, many to come. That's excellent. Perfect. All right. We got a brief, uh, let's do a little gulag segment, and then we're going to get to uh, new buddy, first time guest, Cody Johnson. Do we have our music? Now, I have to be honest with you. I'm, I'm kind of like, for this segment, obviously, I'm all for like the gulag irony and not so irony at times. Um, although I think, yeah, some of these like Stalin memes and stuff are really getting tired. What's interesting about today's gulag entrant is that like actually, yes, 100 percent. Right. So there's a lot of people who we pick who, yes, if I was being honest, I probably would imprison them in some sort of way. I would certainly hector them. I might take away their writing and social media privileges. But uh, this is a person who, like, yes, should be transported into time uh, if he were alive and dumped into a Soviet gulag. And I'm talking about a guy named Luis Posada Carlis. And he was a Cuban uh, terrorist who was recruited by the CIA in the early 1960s. He was involved with everything from the Bay of Pigs to Iran uh, Contra. He worked with drug cartels. He worked with death squads and military juntas across the United States, across the Americas, I should say. And he's actually best known for being the mastermind behind the 1976 bombing of Cubana Flight 455 that killed 73 people, I'm quoting now from the Jackman, an attack against the socialist state in Cuba. Fidel Castro called him the cruelest terrorist in the Western Hemisphere. But Posada's CIA finance career spanned several decades in multiple countries, including the lesser-known stint in El Salvador that placed him at the heart of one of the greatest scandals in U.S. history, Iran-Contra. Posada uh, was dogged throughout his entire career with allegations of being connected with drug cartels. He was also, I believe, connected with the assassination of uh, Ambassador Letarier in uh, Washington, D.C., um, and did extensive work in Iran-Contra. In the early 1990s, he was still on, uh, he was still CIA payroll, I believe, up until the early 1990s. In Panama, in the early aughts, he was arrested with bond, with uh, 200 pounds of um, dynamite and C4. That was in 2000. Um, and I'll quote again, CIA records are rife with concerns about Posada's lies, ties to organized crime and drug trafficking. Nevertheless, the agency formally retained him for over a decade, uh, even as late as 1993, after the notorious airline bombing that the CIA contacted Posada and Honduras to warn him on a, of a plot against his life. One more from the Jackman. As Peter Bor Kornblue of the National Security Archives Cuba Project told the New York Times, Posada was a Frankenstein created on a leash by the CIA itself. Posada was hardly a renegade, and his bloody crusade was no aberration. It was merely the unsavory underbelly of official U.S. policy in the region. Death of a Cold War supervillain by Hillary Goodfriend in the Jacobin. And that is why we sentence for real, I wish... I hope if there is some type of continuity of consciousness, he's getting reincarnated into a gulag. We sentence Luis Posadas Carrelis to the motherfucking gulag, the bin Laden of the CIA, or I guess the second bin Laden of the CIA or something. Or bin Laden was the Carreles of Afghanistan. I don't know, whatever. Fuck it. You get my point. Um, 
Guys, we're going to take a brief break. We'll be right back with Cody Johnson. Welcome back. Michael Brooks on the Michael Brooks Show. Joining us now is Cody Johnstone. He's the host of Some More News. Cody, thanks a million for being here. How are you doing? Doing great. Thank you so much for having me. This is the usual uh, in-studio guest slot, but you're joining us from uh, L.A. So when you come out, when you when you like, you know, get to New York and grind me up your style a little bit, you'll come in studio. That sounds fantastic. That's the first thing I will do when I land. Literally the first thing. Don't even stop to like shower or anything like that. You just get no, off the and plane. And then I'll come right back here. That's right. I like that. I want more commitment like that from guests. Actually, you get out, you get on your, you get on your app, and then you forever negotiate with whatever service you're using because there's a, like some special stupid lane at JFK to pick you up, and then they can't find where you are, and you can't find where they are, and they're like, they're like, my friend, my friend, it is you say, you say, Delta, Delta, and you're like, yes, and then and then they cancel, and then you cancel, and then you end up in a cab. And then you come here, and then you do yeah. the show. And I'll do they have a beer, beer, I guess, in the cab because I'll probably be late because of all those things that just happened. Yes, and then you get in, you sit down, you do the show, and then you get some Discord questions. You have a couple of beers, and then you get out, get back to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get back to beautiful LA. Yeah, Can't wait. Yeah, right. Then you're back, and then you arrive in LA, and and then people when you when people don't know if you haven't traveled to LA when you get to LAX they actually spray aromatherapy on you when you get into the airport. Mm, get nice and relaxed. Yep. Talk about your worthwhile trip that you just did. Yeah. You go like I, I had like a really expansive trip to New York. Like I felt yeah, like I could have done it by phone, but you know, it was great. Um uh Cody let's talk about Elon Musk. Oh, good. I love that guy. Right. Oh, okay. Well, this is going to be a much bigger problem than I anticipated. <laughs> um, let me start with just like what what got you? I'll, I'll tell you after you tell me. But like, what got him on your radar? Like in terms of some, you know, not. I mean, obviously, like I mean, most people know who he is, but just as somebody that actually needed to be talked about and thought about a little bit more critically. Uh, I think it's just a, sort of an accumulation of things over time. Uh, cause I, I like, you know, when I was younger, when he first started doing his stuff, I just liked the idea of what he was doing because he doesn't want electric cars. Um, and I was very into just his general idea of, well, yeah, we're not doing enough for green energy, so I'm going to do it. But then I think the union stuff really got me uh, just sort of finding out more what his worldview was and how he was approaching these things. Um, I don't think he necessarily has like the best intentions all the time. He says a lot of stuff where he's like, you know, we don't want unions because uh, it's not in line with our, our quest for uh, clean, efficient energy. It's like, well, then why are you making like flamethrowers in a candy store? Uh, so he just seems sort of generally dishonest. And then you, you know, you look more and more into him and you see that, uh, he's not any different yeah. from any like billionaire, uh, other than this sort of veneer of like, I'm helping, uh, without doing a lot of the work that I think that re really requires of people. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I, I, I parallel you a lot. I mean, I just structurally, you know, my politics and I think any just kind of basic rational ability to kind of look at the world a little bit, that level of wealth concentration, even for even if it was like Mother Teresa or whoever, and maybe not Mother Teresa, I guess I read the Christopher Hitchens book, I'm trying to think of somebody more innocuous that everybody could agree is a good person. But even if it is... Um, Steph Curry, nobody like a sure. billion dollars is a structurally just it, that shouldn't exist as a category. And it doesn't matter if it's the most ethical people in the world. If you have a society where that level of wealth concentration exists, you have a non-functioning democracy. You don't have the type of broad flow of resources that you need for, you know, 
just sort of broad basic standards and democratic accountability for everyone. So that's number one. And then, yeah, number two, I noticed that here's a guy who it seems to me, in contrast to somebody, frankly, like George Soros, who, of course, I have the same structural critique of, and I'm sure I have different politics than he does, but he actually did like, you know, he has like a washing mechanism with some of his money, right? Like he's dumped his money into some very significant projects which were not clearly just extensions of his own personal self-interest, right? So even if we were right, going to take it in right. that like very, very narrow way. But here's a guy who was able, it seems to me, with like very little effort, brand himself as something that he just literally wasn't. He's a glorified government contractor as this like benign space age adventurer. And that's when I took notice. And then I got a whiff of the cult and the fans. And then I really yeah. became terrified. Yeah, it's uh, it's not healthy. Right. <laughs> um, and like, I mean, I, I think also like people sort of don't even realize how much money that truly is. It's very easy to be like, to think of, of billionaires as very similar to millionaires, which, you know, we can talk about that too, but like, uh, a billionaire is virtually unfathomable. Like that amount of money is right. uh, grotesque. <laughs> and he, I don't know, I think even like, you know, there's this sort of the cult of sort of uh, these people who kind of uh, more associate themselves with Rick on Rick and Morty, or they see on Musk and they think of like Tony Stark or something. Um, and that person doesn't exist. And even then, like right. literally in the first Iron Man, Tony Stark changed his mind after he realized his weapons could be used against Americans. Like there was no moment of like, oh, my God, I'm making weapons of war and that's bad. It's that, oh, some people like use the weapons against me and my and my kind. You can't um, control this massive flow of like light and precision weaponry that I'm just like unleashing across Central Asia and it might hit my tank convoy. Uh, right. Yeah. And he, uh, there's a, uh, when he's announced his, uh, like, obviously all, all of his projects are very personal to him. It, it's all to benefit him. Uh, I think one of the other things that really uh, made me pause was when he started talking about the Hyperloop and all these uh, transportation plans, and it all centered around individuals with their cars to stay away from people. <laughs> right. Uh, which just sort of tells me that he really doesn't get it and doesn't get what we as a society really need um, in, in his realm of what he's doing. But when he announced his, um, his Pravda, his journalist attacking site, because he didn't like people's articles about him, right. uh, someone had uh, mentioned, like, I was, uh, I toured Tesla, and then they made a sign, all these NDAs and these forms, uh, which is not standard for journalists. Uh, I've been a journalist for, you know, 20 years or whatever. Um, his response was like, wow, you're ignorant. I don't remember you. But disclosing classified U.S. missile technology to hostile nations would violate law. And he goes on and it's just like, all right, Elon, thanks for the missile technology. Like, I don't know. I don't know what. He's trying wait, to I thought we exactly. were creating like a green solar planet. I didn't know that. Wait, what? I'm confused. Right. I like thought we were creating this missile secrets now. beautiful future. I had no idea. Okay. What is Elon Musk's background? Because he's also very into deploying the like, I came here with just the shoes of my feet, a backpack, and a handful of rare earth minerals. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, I mean, his parents are rich. He went to all these private schools. He, uh, he grew up in South Africa, right? Literally, literally, yeah. Literally, his uh, dad owned an emerald mine, and there's stories of him just, like, walking around with actual emeralds in his pocket. Uh, at one point, he stole some from his dad and sold them. Uh, and there's, like, a story about how, like... Uh, his how dad, do we like, know that story? Has he said that? couldn't even close. Huh? Has he said that himself? Like, how do we know that story? Uh, that is a story... I'm going to try to pull it up. Uh, that's a story he's told of like, him, it's like him being cheeky sort of thing. Oh, he's being cheeky. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like, or like all of his sort of, uh, retorts on, on Twitter are this air of like, not, not a comic book villain, but kind of. Right. 
where he sort of distances himself from the truth of what really happened in order to make him make the image of him uh, seem fun. Uh, even his like what his flamethrowers. <laughs> <laughs> what is the flamethrower? Uh, what is this thing? What is this flamethrower thing? I've been hearing about it. Like not that? really flamethrowers, yeah. but they like do shoot fire, uh, and like legally you can't uh, import those. Uh, so he changed the name to not a flamethrower. It's all just sort of uh, these like side projects to make money for his boring company. Wait a second, this is Mike Thernovich playing with a not a flamethrower. Are you serious? Are oh, you yeah. are you are you like, connecting? That's the real thing. I don't know if you guys saw. Oh, you come God. over here for a sec. What just hold it in selfie mode so I can kind of see. <laughs> so just hold it like that. So let me go back just a little bit. So are you open, doing it again? No, I'm just gonna show people. Well, yeah, can I do it again from here? Are you gonna be okay? Well, shit. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I. So I'm gonna do. <laughs> Is that his wife? <laughs> <laughs> Mike, you keep doing you, bro. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I didn't even okay. see that. He blocked me a long time ago. <laughs> uh. That's great. So, okay. So, so he grew up. And by the way, this is another thing. I mentioned this once and a lot of like, you know, this type of like dweeb that gets obsessed about Elon Musk said that I was being totally, of course, you know, super racist and unfair. I didn't say anything in the sense that like, I really don't know. But I, um, you know, I'm pretty grounded in, in, in uh, South Africa. Uh, it's an area of interest for me. I cover it quite a bit. If his parents or his dad was involved in major leadership in an emerald mine, presumably at some points before the, the collapse of apartheid. Now, I don't know. Maybe his dad was, like, using his largesse to, like, secretly fund the ANC or something. But I'm just saying, like, can we also add to the ta to like the tally here that it's like this weird sort of rich boy from South Africa who's probably his parents were probably not on the cutting edge of that issue? Yeah. Um, I mean, that yeah, seems that's a really brought the like delved uh, into that. But that's a valid question. If, like given the context and how he acts anyway. Right. I mean, I would be fascinated. Maybe his parents were super cool. Maybe there's lessons he didn't learn from them or something. Or maybe he's, right. maybe he's secretly, you know, maybe. He, but I just, it's just very fascinating to me, especially because he is from, he is South African that he doesn't even like trout out like Nelson Mandela chestnuts. It'd be I mean, a big oversight from the PR guys. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Um, right. You wonder, yeah, what's there and what he, what he's carried with him aside from, you know, emeralds and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, that is exactly how I put it, Cody. That's exactly the type of thing that yeah. I wonder. So, okay. So you found this guy, he's tweeting weird stuff. Nobody should be a billionaire. What is he actually doing? Like what are his actual businesses and what has he actually accomplished? I hear a lot of talk like, Every time I get hit with one of his followers, it's like I'm talking to a vision board and not a real person. It's like, okay, I guess that might be cool if that ever happened, but what actually is? Right, that's the, uh, that's it, right? <laughs> what, is, what, what is it? Because, I, I mean, tangibly, he sold a bunch of uh, electric cars to wealthy people. Right. Um Check. He has developed, uh, I mean, the, uh, the solar panel technology he's developed is very impressive and very cool. Um, it would be neat if he sort of installed them places uh, that desperately need and could use them. Uh, but, like, they're not, that's not available to the public yet. So it's all, it's all these sort of ideas and projects that you think eventually will uh, be available to everybody. It's this sort of, I think it's the mindset of, well, you sell this to rich people and then that's how we make money and then we can invest more and do more research and slowly slowly bring the price down um but that hasn't happened yet i don't think uh the product like the production for uh the model three it has been stalled periodically and that, those are still like 35 40 grand um so I think like really one of the one of the few things I think I can really uh, commend him on is uh, what he's done in Puerto Rico. I wish he did more, honestly, um, but he has like installed his batteries there 
and tried to help the infrastructure. Um, Has he done that, which, though, like without side agreements that like, you know, privatize Puerto Rico's, you know, energy grid into perpetuity? I mean, every time I, I, I don't know, it's just every time I see something like that, I get really wary of the strings that come with those things. Usually, do you know about that? Yeah, I was I had the same reaction. It seems legit from what I can tell. Yeah. Um, and like, even when, when the, when the grid goes out, he sends text, text down there to, cool. to take care of it. Um, so it doesn't seem like this is a, uh, a, a venture of like his to, to actually turn a profit, which I don't think Tesla's done yet either. Um, but he's gotten a lot but, of government uh, contracts, right? I mean, that's the other kind of irony and I have no problem. I think government should be funding and owning a large part of the economy, frankly, but just the brand of that entrepreneur myth with the fact that that's the business model get government contracts. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I don't, the last number I could find was I think from 2015 and it was like $4.9 billion in government subsidies. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, and then when someone brings that up, obviously he's going to be like, well, no, that's not true. And, uh, he'll sort of talk around it. Um, because he wants to have that sort of self-made man right. uh, version of himself out there. Um, you know, I may, I came up with uh, online yellow pages and then I came up with uh, credit card banking, but like online. <laughs> um, I love so, how people think, yeah, think that like, maybe, maybe we're just being shitty, I guess, but it's like every time you get hit with like PayPal, it's like, you know, I think like every single person who has any kind of like basic cognitive function, I think like, especially like if you were like a teenager or something like in the aughts or late nineties, like you, you had like, well, they need to do that before the internet. Right. And you were actually right. Like probably the internet did need whatever, like, I don't know, like, yeah, like eventually you'd be able to oh, buy. For sure. Right. Like so what I'm saying is like that's what those ideas are. Now, of course, the difference is, is you know, ability to access capital and all of that stuff. Like th that's the difference between like a fantasy and an actual business. But the idea that like you went like to the mount, like to Olympos and like from the sky at this like, oh, my God, like on this massive new commerce platform, you're going to need to be able to process credit cards. Who the fuck would have thought of that? It's all these guys. I know. I mean, it's <laughs> okay. like, and I, yeah, I don't want to like, you don't want to diminish what they've done. And like, I you do. know, obviously you, uh, you, I, <laughs> it's fun. It's very fun. Yeah, um, I do. Yeah. But like, even, yeah, when people, uh, anytime anyone talks about like Mark Zuckerberg, it, literally his idea was like how to stalk women at his school, but like literally. do it online. Literally. Like, that is what his idea was. <laughs> like rate, and monitor chicks on the emerging yeah. internet. A girl hurt your feelings, and so you made a website to follow her around. And uh, then, and then, several and I'm sure years that later, really helped, uh, <laughs> us get to where we are now. And then, several but, years later, you're just like, um, yep, Senator. Uh, no, I, uh, I am gonna read all of your instant messages, and uh, you can uh, blow me. <laughs> Anyways, I have a meeting with. Yeah, uh, I guess I, I guess I can't be the president anymore. <laughs> Oh, he probably well. He I can't be. He can't be the president for other reasons. That 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 testimony substantively was recoverable, but not um, presentationally. So no, he's. I mean, he's been trying. <laughs> he's been yeah. like a couple of years. He's been like hiring all these people to like really ramp up, and I think that everything of the past five months has just confirmed to him like, oh no, I'm not even going to be able to try to be the president anymore. Joel uh, Benison. He was uh, Hillary's. I think chief strategist and a pollster for Obama was plucked up by Zuckerberg, <laughs> which is, it's mm -hmm. actually so funny to me because it's like, and Joel Benison, like definitely when he was in his lane, did some effective work for Obama, but like, it's so, it's funny because even that hiring decision belies like the mythology of Silicon Valley being like rule breakers. It's like, Oh, well I'm interested in politics. Let me hire a guy who just helped crash Clinton's campaign and who has like, you know, the most conventional baby boomer political CV imagine like, you know, Clinton Gore, 
You know, the only interesting thing he did was like go for Obama at a certain point in terms of his political career. His actual, that guy's overall professional career is very interesting. I listened to an interview with him once. But like, it's just kind of funny. Like, if you were a real, like, you know, quote unquote rule breaker, maybe you'd hire a political advisor that wasn't like involved in every major center right Democratic campaign. Oh, yeah. The safest. It's the safest thing he could have done. He also, uh, who was it? There's a Bush, an old Bush uh, campaign aide he hired, too. He just sort of went on a, I can't think of the name, uh, but, like, he just basically went to, like, what are the last four major political campaigns? Hire me all of them. <laughs> I want to hire like, all, all right, of man. them. Yeah, yeah. I guess I guess that'll work. That's a good. Uh, I, I believe that you have ideas that are specific. What if uh, everybody's information was created was uh, fed into a billboard, and then citizens could raid each other in a public way? Can it scan my eyeball if I look at it? Yeah. Well, that's, I think then, that's then I'm down. All right, let's do it. Let's do it. Zach. <laughs> then I'm down. Uh, talk a little bit more about the labor stuff. We've been alluding to it. I've mentioned it before, but let, let's get really specific. There should be no doubt whatsoever, even if you can't get any of the other stuff, that Elon Musk is a, a bu- he is anti-labor. Yeah, it's very. I mean, it's very clear. And every, I mean, every time an article comes out about it, he goes on his rant, leading up to eventually starting a website to downvote the articles that he doesn't like about himself. Um, but <laughs> Yes, it's the motivation uh, beyond mean, like public extortion of journalists on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and plus, man, yeah. You give that guy a billion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, he's, it's been for years, you know, and I, like, I think part of, I, I, I don't agree with this, but I know that part of this comes from his idea of how the world is now and what needs to be done to sort of accelerate uh, our progress to where we need to be uh, with energy and all, all these sort of projects he has. Um, I think uh, it's sort of sort of in line with Peter Thiel's uh, ideology a little bit. Definitely. Um, probably minus the feudalism. But uh, so he, Tesla is not unionized. I think it's the only uh, car manufacturer that isn't in the United States. Um, and they've, you know, the workers have been uh, trying to unionize. Uh, there was the hearing was today, I think yesterday actually, uh, about this because a bunch of workers were fired, and they're uh, fired for trying to Tesla. unionize. Right, uh, Tesla says that's not why they were fired, but uh, all the all the workers, almost all the workers that were fired, had been passing out pamphlets about unions. Uh, there was one, someone gave testimony today that like they were wearing a union shirt or like a pro union shirt. And then a bunch of security guards kept harassing him and uh, wanted him to like remove his shirt or just leave. Um, even though he'd like worked there for five years. Uh, so there's just this sort of general idea about it. Uh, whenever it's brought up, Elon will say that they can unionize whenever they want. Nothing's stopping them. You know, uh, I I personally wouldn't because then uh, they wouldn't get their stock options, uh, which isn't like a union thing. Like no union is saying you can't offer stock options. Uh, that's just a like a literal threat that Elon tweeted yep. uh, that if you unionize, this is what you're going to lose. Um, it's very bizarre, actually, because there's uh, in one of his recent uh, one of his recent earnings calls, he was yelling at investors who were worried and basically said that. Uh, you know, if you're worried about like volatility, don't invest. You know, if you're worried about your, your, your shares or anything, don't do it because this is a volatile company. So like <laughs> you're Always threatening to take away something that you don't even think is that valuable. Right. Uh, right. So this is weird, like talking around this uh, idea that like union unionizing is bad and if you do, you'll lose this thing. But when I'm talking to actual investors, I'm telling them that that thing doesn't matter. Right, right. Do you think that? I mean, um, I, I also want to touch briefly. I mean, I obviously I don't reduce politics to these terms at all, and I, you know, but I just on a very basic level, especially for the type of person who will throw you like these Musk talking points. 
he contributes a good amount of money to Republicans, right? And even if we set aside a much more filled out debate on, frankly, how much this kind of myth of progress can get us anywhere, this is actually, when we look at, you know, Elon Musk, this is why all of a sudden it's important to, like, deal with, you know, Steve Pinker's new book and these kind of, like, techno-utopian fantasies, which seem to always just increase inequality and deregulation and do not have you know, the answer to things like the climate crisis, uh, you know, and, and the Democratic Party's failings, right, like, uh, which are numerous, but even on an incredibly narrow level, like, even if we were just going to be like, none of the big stuff is in play, but, you know, God damn it, I'm a Democrat, and I believe in science, and blah, 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 and Elon Musk is great, and you guys are just slamming him for no reason, and blah, blah. Doesn't Elon Musk, in terms of campaign contributions, has significantly supported the Republican Party in a way that if we were to translate to policy, certainly would more than make up for a handful of Teslas deployed on the highways of Santa Monica? Right. Like, yeah, it's I, I, and I don't know if he even views it as that, because I think that, you know, if he's contributing to people, he thinks will allow him to do more. Uh, yep. and give him more freedom. Uh, but does that really, if you, if you consider every single thing that like a Republican will support, does that make it worth it? Is, is that really going to cancel out? Like you said, like a couple of Teslas on the highway, uh, maybe a, a few houses in the suburbs have a giant Tesla battery in the garage. That's great. But like, what, what else are you contributing to? And you got billions and billions of dollars, uh, which I can't, I just can't get past. Um, I know. It's unbelievable. The, what, what also gets me, and I want your thought, I'm asking everybody about this. What, I think that if you, I mean, look, maybe like the rando people on Twitter who will like obsess, you know, like, if you send something out about him, about his labor practices, and they go, you don't understand, you're trying to stop progress, and Elon Musk is the greatest man ever, or, you know, whatever. Like, I don't know, maybe those people are actually secretly captains of industry. Maybe every single comment you see like that is, like, secretly a Peter Thiel or Elon Musk sock puppet or something. Right. But if that isn't true, and there are normal people who are not wealthy, they are not part of this game and they will not almost certainly will not be. What is the psychology that could possess somebody to worship people like this? It's just so bizarre to me. What do you think that's about? It is. It is very bizarre. Um, I, I mean, there's a lot going, there's a lot going on there. Um, I do think there's an element of that, type of person who and again i'm going to cite rick and morty and i don't like you know whatever you think about that show it's fine it's funny uh but i think that there's sort Matt of and David of, like hate a, it they're trying to get into a fight with you right now but they're they're hanging I don't, my... don't fight me it's fine <laughs> um, <laughs> don't fight. But I, think... I like it you know you do need to come in studio you're definitely bringing some california energy to the show <laughs> I, think, I think it's got some funny jokes in it. Uh, no, it is. But it, it does I do have think some that funny, people misinterpret it a lot. Yeah, because um, it's a little more not. I'm not gonna say nuanced, but like I, I think that people watch that show and they're like, "I'm the smartest guy in the world too, and right. I can be a piece of shit." Mm -hmm. um, and I think that there is also like I mean I think that we've sort of been touching on it. Like everyone's there's this just a general sense that everyone is failing us and all these institutions are not doing the things that need to be done. Right. So even if you have a person who's not necessarily doing all of the things that uh, he should, he's still presenting himself as being one of the few who can actually help. Uh, so I think there is a sort of like savior uh, complex that people have. Um, but at the same time, like we, I mean, we've, we're all lied to about like, <laughs> if you have, if you have money, you earned it. And if you don't, you didn't work hard enough. And I think that there's a, a bunch of people who sort of like look at Elon Musk and look at uh, billionaires or, or millionaires like that and think, well, I'm, I'm that too. I'm just not rich yet. Right. Like we're all, we're all rich, but like, I just haven't achieved it. Uh, there's a, a, a very, 
prescient uh, Futurama moment where like Richard Nixon is running for president again. And uh, his uh, idea is to ground up the poor and use their, their teeth as gravel for the rich. Uh, and Fry is cheering them on. And Lila's like, well, what are you cheering for, Fry? You're not rich. And he's like, well, yeah, but someday I might be. And then people like me better watch their step. And it's like <laughs> that sort of contempt for where you are uh, yeah. and belief that you're this uh, other thing. Um, so you support the idea and the institutions that, that brought those people uh, to the top. I think that's exactly it. Uh, Cody Johnstone, he's the host of Some More News. I'm a regular viewer. And uh, Cody, this is actually, we've been cook, cooking up a lot of stuff, man. This is going to be the first of, uh, of more, more collaborations. Between yeah, this is great. Hope to be back. Definitely, man. Looking forward to it. I really appreciate the time. Yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we uh, – uh, can we get out – I apologize, Matt. I'm going to see if I can find this, but it's Teacher Lauren's Mom's GoFundMe. I think it's GoFundMe. Have we put it up before? We have put it up before, and we've put it – and we've put it up – what? Miriam? Yep, Miriam. That's right. So – Basically, um, we've already done an incredible job, and I, I'm i going to contribute again myself tomorrow morning. But Lauren, who's a really important part of our community, and again, if you were you know, hanging out on uh, Discord, you've certainly been able to have the pleasure of interacting with her. Her mother, Miriam, was diagnosed this early, uh, earlier this year with Graves' disease and thyroid eye disease. And she's been basically she's been going through a process uh, and she just recently got denied. I believe it was um, Social Security benefits while she goes through this. She cannot work right now while she goes through these operations. Um, they're at uh, six thousand four hundred and three, which is an incredible community. And the goal is to get to eight thousand five hundred um, to basically just make sure that like, you know, meals and roof and everything is taken care of um, while the operations in this process is completed. So I'd really like people to join me in supporting it if you can. Um, it's uh, The URL is blocked by a pillar, but could you mind reading the URL out, Matt? Yeah, let me uh, pull it over to my thing here. Go back to my thing. Yeah, you could just... It's uh, gofundme.com slash please dash support dash Miriam. I'd really like, if you can, I'd really like everybody to do that. Um, it's definitely, you know, real, you know, it's a great way to concretely help somebody in our community. And obviously, the bigger lesson is that it's a total and absolute moral obscenity that anybody should be put in a position like this. Healthcare should be absolutely free, universal, completely covered. This should never be something that anybody goes through. And it's... Um, you know, again, a product of just just sort of utter moral failings and systemic corruptions of our political, economic, and healthcare systems that could, this could be the case. So we're going to fight that. We're going to win. We're going to create a healthcare system that works for everyone. And in the meanwhile, we're going to, uh, you know, show up for our friends and our community. So uh, definitely help Miriam. Uh, and please do, if you haven't yet, become a patron today. When we hit 2,000 uh, uh, patrons, even more uh, uh, things, and already a lot already. We're really firing on all cylinders here. The post game is going to be the crew. We have Mike in studio. He's a patron. He's great. Enjoying yourself, Mike? Yeah. Sweet. Mike, one of our great callers, also a Discord participator, yeah. um, and a meetup meter. When I do occasional meetups, uh, another one coming soon. Um, Patreon.com slash TMBS. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thank you, intern James. Thank you, DJ Danarchy. Thank you, Chris Lapaco. See you in the postgame.